Hello, BookTube, and welcome to New Worlds November, a brand new BookTube event in which we celebrate science fiction. <laughs> this was the brainchild of uh, Scott and Becky at the Bookish Bryants, and a whole bunch of great co-hosts uh, that were reading science fiction uh, all through the month of November. And that's, of course, a vast enterprise. So we narrowed it down to short fiction, fewer than 200 pages. And then we had prompts as well that have been one week at a time. And we just finished up the third prompt, which was time travel. Uh, and now we're moving on to the fourth prompt, which is uh, dystopian and post-apocalyptic. And I've been narrowing the field even more myself by reading only stories from the square-bound pulp periodicals that publish science fiction stories in the United States, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Analog, and Asimov's. And I'm going to have a lot to read from those uh, in the upcoming week. But before I do that, since I had an initial throat clearing on all the other prompts, I might as well do the uh, one on this one as well. And the, the eerie thing about this prompt is that it keeps our pendulum swinging <laughs> back and forth with the prompts that we've had. The first prompt for New World's November was Aliens. And I had to point out in my introductory throat clearing there that we don't have any evidence that there are any aliens. No radio signals, no, no other electronic signals or energy signals of any kind no ability to see them of course no confirmable evidence that they exist in any way and that's just technologically intelligent aliens we also don't have any evidence that any alien life exists at all even so much as a microbe as far as we know we are the only life anywhere in the universe uh, certainly i think that as far as we know we're the only life of any kind in our own solar system but i would also broaden that out to our local group, at the very least. If there were a technological species that was in any way interested in making itself known, or even accidentally disclosing itself, anywhere in the local group, we'd know that by now. We don't listen to all the sky, and we don't listen to it all at once, and we haven't been listening to it for all that long, but it would be obvious. It would be obvious, and it's not. There's nothing. Dead silence. When it, plenty of noise, but dead silence when it comes to signal. So I had to point out as a wet blanket that our first prompt of New World's November was essentially fantasy. And then we move on to the second prompt, which was robots and AI. And there I had to point out that the pendulum had swung all the way in the other direction. We all live with robots and AI. And I argue that we live more under the, the control of AI than most people realize. Your car, your truck, your doctor, your airplane, <laughs> your loan department, your hospital. There's a lot more AI running things behind the scenes than a lot of people think, and a lot of key capacities where they just assume that only humans are involved, when actually for a while it's been no humans involved. And I also pointed out in a little bit of scaremongering during that throat clearing that, that a lot of the, the more advanced versions of this AI talk to each other without human interlocutors anymore and learn from each other without human interlocutors anymore. I find that very frightening. I don't know. Maybe other people don't. I think it's kind of creepy that there are AI, active AI protocols running security drills on U.S. nuclear submarines. I find that a kind of disturbing. That, that isn't just all humans with, with purely mechanical toggles and switches. Uh, so I had to point that out about... Uh, robots and AI. And then we moved on for the third week to time travel. And uh, I had to be a wet blanket once again and point out that the pendulum had swung all the way the other way and that time travel to me looks increasingly like fantasy. It looks like something that science does not allow to happen. Because you aren't uh, an individual totally compartmentalized thing separate from the time, the chronological wave function that governs your reality. You aren't separate from that. You're part of that. Not only do you perceive the wave function of time around you in exactly the same way that everybody else does, but also your the time as it affects your own entropy, your body's entropy, is exactly the same as the time that affects everybody else's entropy. And the reason for that isn't because time has only one nature. We know that it doesn't. It's instead that your time has only one nature. You are part of that. It, it's We could go take it all the way back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Is the cat in the box alive or dead? Well, when you open the box, you create a wave function, and you are part of that wave function. So the cat it will be alive in a wave function in which you perceive it as being alive, in which you're there to see it. It's, 
I'm summarizing here because of the limited extent that I understand it. it could take me two hours to say. But the point being what I mentioned yesterday, which is that I think increasingly for time travel to work, you would first have to posit an unbelievable superpower in which someone could de detach themselves from their own space-time continuum in order to go voyaging in time. And that would be huge. That would be a huge deal. Would you even survive that? Would your space-time continuum survive that? I don't know. And I think that's, that is the given that is just shrugged off in all time travel stories. So I was, I was a little bit less uh, happy with that because it, it also, to me, seems to be fantasy. Uh, and now the pendulum has swung again. <laughs> now the pendulum has swung again to dystopian and post-apocalyptic. And this is, in one sense, the oldest of all the prompts of the four that we're doing for this year, for New World's November. But for the first 1900, 2900 years of human literacy, you could have a post-apocalyptic story, but it took place in heaven. <laughs> there wasn't any idea that the, it was, it was so incredibly theocratic, so incredibly theological, that there was no idea that there would be a world after the end of the world, so to speak. Uh, whereas since science, since Darwin, and especially since the proliferation of nuclear warheads, we now have that as a thing that we think that our ancestors a thousand years ago would not have thought, which is we, in other words, have the ability to destroy all life on the surface of the planet. Uh, a full-blown thermonuclear exchange between two robust and technologically advanced thermonuclear powers would probably release enough uh, deadly radiation and energy into the atmosphere to destroy all life that isn't on deep sea vents anywhere on Earth. And we've known that for a while. A certain uh, Those of us who are certain of a generation grew up with that as a background worry. What happens if the Russians or Washington pushes the button? That's how we put it. We knew that we wouldn't survive, any of us. No matter where you are, you wouldn't survive. And lurid fantasies started to be written along those lines, right? You know that even if you're not struck, even if you're not incinerated or destroyed by a nuclear bomb, which we at least know what that looks like, thanks to the United States, thanks to Harry Truman, we know what that looks like. Uh, if a city full of people is hit by a nuclear bomb, we know what that looks like. But even if that doesn't happen to you, you still know, we know more and more, we know to a fine detail now, what happens when huge clouds of radiation vent into the atmosphere. You know where the winds will take them. You know that you could be thousands of miles away and still be affected by them or killed by them if they're in strong enough concentration. So people started to write lurid fantasies about what that would be like. Neville Shute wrote On the Beach, which was made into a very, very effective movie. If you haven't seen the movie of On the Beach, you really should. It is a perfect hallmark example of Steve's contention that the movie is always better than the book. Well, the book is still relatively effective. The movie is, is genius. Absolute, absolutely brilliant. And in the movie... The writer is taking, Neville Shute is taking a clumsy, ham-handed account of those uh, global atmospheric currents. And he has estimated that the people, the last people to be affected by these currents of radiation, of hard radiation, that was going to kill all the crops, kill all the people, would, would exist in one tiny little pocket of Australia. And that they would know the end is coming. Because they've, they've watched this progress. We know this in even more detail. The scientists were able to map down to the last county, the the radioactive drift from Fukushima. So these stories have, have become part of our reality in a way that, for instance, aliens certainly have not, that time travel certainly has not. Some of you have been, have been rather strenuously emailing me about time travel, saying, well, thanks to Einsteinian relativity, a person down deeper in a, in a gravity well is experiencing time at a different ratio than someone way, way up at the top of that of that gravity well. I think we can agree that's not the same thing as time travel. That dilation, sure, from space-time is one thing, but go, that's not you going back to grandma's childhood. <laughs> but uh, We also know that this is true of post-apocalyptic visions. We know what they will look like. We know how it would work. We don't have to fantasize about whether or not we're going to be visited by silicon-based life. And in addition to that, that hypothetical is now part of all of our lived experience. But in addition to that, we have all sorts of dystopian and post-apocalyptic stuff that isn't hypothetical anymore, which is kind of scary. Scient climate scientists are saying that we have, at best, 15 years to stop a runaway greenhouse effect from taking part, which might be slow in terms of human lifetimes, but once it starts, 
it will have catastrophic effects on the lives of your grandchildren, your children. Uh, scientists can now plot out those hypotheticals down to the last decimal point. Uh, in, keeping in mind, among other things, our sister planet Venus, which went through exactly that. The latest research shows that Venus was very probably a blue sky, blue water planet for well over a billion years. And then a runaway greenhouse gas effect happened along the exact same lines, exact same physics involved as the one that is threatening Earth now. And Venus is unlivable now. Tin would melt on the heat of the surface. Uh, but it's not just those hypothetical models. It's also the real world. We have uh, fire seasons now that are catastrophic to watch and last for a long time, where they didn't before, where there would be fires, but not a whole season of fires destroying whole landscapes. We have a much warmer world. It is a much, much warmer world. Imagine what what Steve from 1950, if there were such a thing, would have thought if you had told him that in 2021, the winter didn't get even slightly cold until four days before Thanksgiving. Imagine what he would say. He'd say, no, no, there'll be a hard frost in late September. There'll be dustings of snow in October. And by Thanksgiving, we'll have had at least one sizable snowstorm, and it will be cold all the time. No, no, <laughs> no, that hasn't been true in a long time, and it's getting worse. Every year that we go through is successively the hottest year ever on record. Each, each current year breaks the tally of the last year. Crops fail. Uh, coastline cities are further and further damaged, battered by storms that once upon a time they could sail out with a little bit more, a uh, little bit less catastrophic reaction. Hurricanes feeding on the warm water of the North Atlantic, feeding on the warm water of the South Atlantic. Hurricanes feed on warmth and, and warm water, warm placid water. That's where they draw their energy. They get it. They are getting worse. You're not noticing it. You didn't notice it in 2021 because a great deal of those hurricanes never made landfall. But we shot right through the naming calendar of storms that got big and strong enough to be named. The first time ever that's happened for the, the meteorological societies had to shoot right through all the variable names and move on from there. Now, you might think, well, that's just a weather nerd thing. They just had to find different names to call these storms. But we're talking, we're talking 20 storms strong enough to be named by the, by the early part of November. And you're thinking it's weather nerd stuff to just wonder what we're going to call them. But okay, imagine if six of those had made landfall instead of the two that did. Imagine if six had. Or imagine if ten had. Or imagine if all 20 had. <laughs> it's not impossible. And that will bring home the reality even more. So the, the wet blanket throat clearing that I want to do for the fourth prompt here is that we are already experiencing dystopian and post-apocalyptic life. Well, post-apocalyptic, not so much, but it could happen at any time. But dystopian, certainly. <laughs> certainly we are. We are starting to feel what that is like directly. So much like robots and AI, which were an absolute fantasy for, for instance, Steve in 1950. And Steve in 1950, hypothetically, if he weren't a sexy 28-year-old, would have lived long enough to see that happen, at least begin to happen. So too with the Steve in 1950 who would have said no matter what happens, thermonuclear war, the instability of governments, taxes long lines at the gas pump, no matter what happens, the earth is still the same. That Steve would have said that. And in 2021, going on 2022, he is wrong. The world is changing right under our feet. So that's what we're going to be exploring. This is the last time that I will bang the doom drum. Instead, we will go into, we will look at the stories uh, starting tomorrow. But I wanted to start off that way because this has been fun. These conceptual uh, prompts are fun. For me, <laughs> not for you or anybody else, but, but anyway, that, that's the beginning of this new week, the last week of New World's November in 2021. Hope you'll join us. Uh, if, you, if you know of a favorite post-apocalyptic, the problem with post-apocalyptic novels is that they tend to be long. Uh, if you know of one that isn't, or if you want to try some short stories, I have, I have a wealth of things to pick from here at this very old, very old house. So I will be looking through... Asimov's an analog in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. I'm going to try and go back to 2021 and, and see what I can find. I had to range away from 2021 to look for time travel stories, but post-apocalyptic, I think I'll find much richer pickings. So we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out together tomorrow. I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.